Good morning, my friends. Welcome back to the Books and Cables YouTube channel. I have no idea what episode this is because it's been a little bit of time since I made the last video. Um, main reason for that, and I feel like um, because the main purpose of this video is to just tell you about the two finished objects I've had for this year. I feel like it would be disingenuous to start that without addressing kind of the ongoing discussion on um, racism and inclusion in the knitting community. What I will say is that I know for myself this takes a lot of energy and emotional labor. So because I have, I personally have, and many others have written plenty of material on this, what I'm going to do is provide links down below to all of those things. Um, and that will be my attempt to address that without rehashing it here because that is a lot of the reason why I haven't really had the energy to make a video is that um, I put myself out there a lot in the last few months that these discussions have been ongoing and it's taken a toll on my mental health in addition to some things that have been happening in real life and so um, it's made me a little bit hesitant to um, participate in too many different channels um, where I usually do so I've limited it to Instagram for the last couple of months just to kind of save my sanity but I think it's really important to um, for me not to come back on to a video and not say that yes it is a um a conversation that is ongoing and developing and i feel very strongly that um we all have our own personal responsibilities and journeys to go on in order to sort of um work on dismantling um internalized racism within ourselves and also um in ensuring that the actions that we partake in how we treat the world um, is inclusive and ultimately works to uh, break down some of the existing power structures that um, lead to the systematic oppression of black and brown peoples. So um, I'm not sure if I was particularly eloquent on that. I am personally a lot better when I can um, sit and slowly formulate my thoughts on paper and so um, I just felt that it was important to still say it before I um, jumped back into sort of knitting podcasting and um, and although I'm saying right now I don't really have the energy to fully address it I'm not going to shut it down forever um, just saying for to take care of myself I will for this video be telling you about the knitting again. So um, what I wanted to tell you about are the two finished objects I have had for 2019. Um, there was the Rambling Woman cardigan which I don't believe I talked about previously on a video um, but I did show in my vlogmas like basically the whole process I went through to make it and then I did um, a steep clip like where I cut the middle of it to make it into a cardigan on one of the last episodes of the Logmas so I will link that down below so you can kind of see what it looks like it is beautiful it's one of my favorite um, projects I've ever made and um, it was um, deceptively easy I think the color work although there was a lot of it um, there wasn't a lot of long floats and um, most of the charts were pretty straightforward so um, definitely recommend that as maybe not your first but maybe as a first steaking project because it is um, quite stunning and kind of a statement piece which would um, be a unique addition to a wardrobe and like kind of elevate perhaps a um, simple outfit with like a fun card game. So, that um didn't bring with me which is good i'll put a picture up um i've learned how to use adobe premiere more actually speaking of which so i can actually edit these videos and cut out all the bits where i don't make sense so yes <laughs> um so speaking of 
long floats and complicated charts, you would have already seen that I'm wearing this sweater. So this, this little baby, is the For Fox Sake um, sweater by Maxim Knitter, so Maxime Sayre, who is a designer and illustrator based in Montreal. And actually, I believe he's in town in Ottawa this week, or in Gatineau, because we have like a, a book festival. So I'm uh, trying to see if I can um, go and um, show up with this sweater to be like, hey, I made it. Anyway, um, so oh, I already got it dirty. <laughs> so this uh, sweater was mm, quite involved, <laughs> let's say, because there was a lot of long floats, very long floats, like up to maybe 18 stitches. Well, you can see like you have bits where the orange is only on here and on the other side and then um and you're and then most rows you were carrying three strands of yarns at the same time so this yoke usually i like will just bang out the yoke like because i love doing the color work part of the sweater and I just want to like get through it as fast as possible but I believe the yoke itself took me maybe a whole month to knit whereas the remainder of the sweater only took me about a week so um like it wasn't continuous I don't think it was that a lot of time I would start it and then get frustrated because there was like too many yarn in my hand and then I would put it aside but I have to say it was a really good learning experience so I wouldn't say it's a pattern for your first color work or even maybe your third but it is um, absolutely a um, very well written pattern and um, and one that is uh, worth doing if you're interested in kind of stepping up your um, color work skills and um, taking on three strands and long floats. So what I will say about the long floats, because I think this is a question that I get a lot, it for long floats, I personally don't think that they should be um, caught because, and I'll tell you why, the reason why I don't catch floats and I don't really think whether we should, but you know, I'll let you form your own opinion on that, is that it makes the fabric um, not as flexible or drapey as well the float will show through on the other side um, this is much more of a problem if you're doing a dark color and a light color but um, which is typically the case if you're doing a high contrast in a color work so I feel like it shows up on the other side if it's maybe very busy you wouldn't notice it but like on something like this where you have a long float every single row, like that's really bothering me, Heidi, how did you do this? Um, where you have a long float to every row, I feel like it would be very obvious where you're catching them. So what I do, if there's um, a significant length of time with long floats, is the invisible stranding technique. I've talked about this before. I first tried it on my Eshel sweater, um, and I can link below to the video, the two videos where I talk about that more extensively, if you're interested in that sweater. Um, here's a picture of it. Um, but essentially what you do is um, like a simple double knitting. So when you're double knitting, you're um, knitting one side. So you knit a stitch and then you move the yarn to the other side and then you knit um, and you skip that stitch. So like, or like a tubular cast on where you knit a stitch, skip one, knit a stitch, skip one and then you just move the yarn back and forth so that it doesn't get um it doesn't show on the front facing side so that's kind of the idea is like you like double knit just one stitch in the middle and that creates a back layer which will have the floats secure against the fabric without um being actually integrated to being part of the fabric and um what i found is that um the end result is kind of just um, so this is the fabric here and it's kind of just a long floating and it doesn't interfere with kind of the uh, structural integrity. Oh, am I, 
Am I using big words for the sake of it? So I sound like, oh. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, f I feel like it's a little bit more flexible. It also adds an additional layer of warmth, which is very important for here in Ottawa because I have to tell you, it's been quite a winter. If you follow me on Instagram and on Instagram stories, I complain about this so much, but why don't people put salt down on the sidewalks? The roads are fine, but okay, like I, I have to physically, so I have to choose between getting hit by a car or slipping and falling and dying? That's cool. <laughs> so you can tell I feel very strongly about this. Um, this is because, I don't know if I ever mentioned this anywhere, but I don't have a driver's license. Um, and uh, this is usually when people go, oh, you don't have a driver's license? I'm like, isn't that what I just said? Um, but I don't have a driver's license because I feel very strongly about the environment and I don't believe that we should be driving <laughs> uh, because of the impact on the environment. But most cities are designed around cars and so even though there's like bylaws and things like that to um, tell people to plow snow and ice and everything, it doesn't um, often get applied in practices and to be fair we've had kind of four snow major snowstorms of like 30-40 centimeters of snow uh, within just January whereas I would say the previous year we had one major snowstorm for the whole season. So, um, I think Mother Nature is mad at us, but also, um, it is an exceptionally bad year, so maybe I'll forgive people for not shoveling and plowing right away. I think part of the thing that's been uh, frustrating too is that the temperature keeps dropping to like minus 40 Celsius, and then it'll come back up to 10, and then everything will melt, but then it'll immediately drop again, so all of it is like ice. So I love skating to work. It's fun. But um, yeah, there's been a, a few times where I've woken up the entire neighborhood because I slipped and then I, a lot of words came out of my mouth. Not all of them great. <laughs> well, no, I felt I really like some of those words, but uh, maybe they're not uh, for the kiddos. <laughs> so I don't remember where I was going with this. I don't know how I got started on telling you a sidewalk story. Um, Max the Knitter pattern foxy. No, for fox sake. Um, yeah, this is what the underside looks like. I'm trying to show you without getting naked. Maybe I'll just put up a picture. <laughs> That'll be easier. So it looks like little braids on the backside. Yeah, it's my favorite technique that I ever learned for color work. It's made it much easier. Um, I think it does make it a little bit slower to knit because you are adding an extra stitch every few inches sort of thing, but in the grand scheme of things, I think the um, result outweighs the extra time and effort that it takes. So that's this sweater. Um, to be honest, I don't know if I talked about that in sufficient detail, so if you have any additional questions about this pattern and how to make it and all that, I'm happy to answer them, so just leave them below. Um, and I will tell you about the other sweater that I finished, which I love. Um, so this is, what is this called? This is the Willow Wood, or as um, my friends from my knitting group that I go to every Saturday that I actually host. So if you're in the Ottawa area um, and you wanted to come, send me a message and I'm happy to tell you where, um, where we're meeting and at what time. We're in the Byward Market area, if you're familiar with Ottawa. So, oh wait, one more thing about this sweater, which I keep pointing out to people. I tucked in all the ends and then I went out and then I realized I missed one major one. And so I've been like walking up to people being like, look, I forgot this end because I don't know. I like pointing out my own mistakes. <laughs> so this is the other sweater I finished this month or in the last two months. And that is the Willow Wood. It is very, as you can see, very boxy and cropped um, and it has sleeves. And my friends and my uh, knitting group that I go to every Saturday, which is why I brought up that subject, Make fun of me because I basically keep calling it the sweater with the sleeves because I can never remember the name of this pattern. So I kept saying, you know my sweater with the sleeves? 
and then and then they're like you mean every sweater i'm like no no you'll know what i'm talking about if i show you it's the sweater with the sleeves and then i show them and they're like oh. so then we've all started calling it the sweater with the sleeves um but it has these gorgeous very um would you call this a puff sleeve or well it just has a excellent sleeve detail. So this is a design by Caitlin Hunter and it was in, sorry I'm just gonna tuck my little end out of the way, um, it was in the, not the current issue of Pom Pom, which I actually got a copy of yesterday, so I'm excited to show you what I'm gonna make out of it. Um, the previous episode of Pom Pom, the winter one, the one guest edited by Nora Gone. So this is a pattern by Caitlin Hunter, which was in that issue. So I think the theme of the issue is kind of um, Victorian warrior from so it's very like sort of elegant and feminine but also kind of fierce and um worry so they I think a lot of it is inspired by like armor details so this is one of those and um it was very easy you just knit it you knit it in the round, you just knit a big piece of um, maroon fabric in the round until you get to the sleeves and then um, you split and then do short rows for the shoulders and then um, when you cast off you pick up the stitches for the collar and then you do this minor color work detail and then the ribbing and then you pick up for the sleeves and then you, um, you do all of these baubles which was the reason why I took so long to finish this project because as much as I love bubbles and I do actually like doing them and um, like the process of like seeing them come together but doing this many of them in one row I was like I can't there's too many bubbles and then you're you feel like you can never make it to the end of the row because you're just you keep knitting and then turning and then knitting and turning and, and like it just yeah it's like you're taking one step forward, two steps back. So I knit, I knit this, I think, I think, I don't think this project actually took me a lot of time in real time, like maybe two to three weeks, but I put it down a lot because um, I kind of um, rushed through the body and then it took me forever to convince myself to do the other sleeve because I was like not looking forward to the bobble sections. Um, the one thing I did notice I made a mistake on is um, I was using 16 inch circulars for the for the um, final rib and I think I instead of magic looping it I just used it as max um, extent. So what happened is this cuffs ended up being knit as if it was at a bigger gauge and so you can and then this one I did it properly so you have one really wide sleeve and one really small sleeve, so I have to go back and fix that later. But I think it's gorgeous. I'll put up a picture of me wearing it. It hits me at a really good spot, like right at my natural waist. So um, with a dress underneath, it's a really flattering, um, I feel like it's a really flattering place. And then I just like walking around like this with it on <laughs> because of how big the sleeves are. So it's really fun. <laughs> I always love um, I always love a project that has extra fun attached to it. Um, oh, actually, one last thing about both of these sweaters. So, um, this year I really wanted to focus on more affordable yarns. Well, I had kind of a two-pronged approach to how I wanted to shop. So, on one hand, I wanted to transition from using kind of more expensive yarns from Brooklyn Tweed because like last year I used Brooklyn Tweed Loft a lot and um, I don't regret it I liked it and you know it, th this hobby is what I primarily this hobby and food is primarily what I spend money on as a person who is single and um, has a fairly stable job that's what I choose to spend my money on but on the other hand I do have a tendency to make too many sweaters in a year and I was starting to get a lot of sort of anxiety around spending money in that way um, especially because I was kind of like planning my life around that which is weird I think it's because like 
I've had kind of a tough year and so usually what I do is I take like a hobby like this or pre you know I take it just kind of hyper focus on something and then like invest way too much into it. I did the same thing when I was like really into fountain pens is like whenever I'm having kind of a tough time I just like hyper focus on something and then I end up like dumping a lot of money into it and then justifying it by saying oh but I'm you know I don't do I don't go out I don't you know blah 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 and and this is the only hobby I have but then it becomes sort of um, a source of more anxiety because of the money spending aspect and um, like I will in you know I, I'm gonna be very clear like what I want to do is to spend less money on yarn um, but I also recognize like I have the privilege of being able to choose what I spend my money on whereas like I know a lot of people are knitting for necessity or making stuff for necessity because they really can't afford it and so like um, I'm although like I'm able to jump between like low and high end because I can kind of plan my finances around it not having any dependence I recognize like a lot of people don't have that luxury and that's why they end up um, not end up but like they if they do knit they're using whatever yarn that they um, can buy and afford and so I also wanted to do like a disclaimer that like yes I recognize like I'm talking about using like $20 of skein yarn to now like really scaling myself back but so long story short I'm trying to focus on more affordable yarns on one hand and also kind of more sustainable yarns on the other so if there's any chance of like bringing those two together I try my best um, because I don't really necessarily believe that the more money you spend on a yarn the better it is it's more about like the content and what um, how the process of making it um, and I guess that's my other prong which was the sustainability aspect is I'm really trying to avoid superwash yarn and also nylon containing yarn um, without getting into it too much because I think some people feel very strongly about this topic and I think su superwash yarn does have a place because it's what allowed the wool industry to survive for so many years but um, as a consumer now it's really like important to me to um, not necessarily use superwash yarn because the super washing process does like either like it's either a full like chemical stripping of the kind of the, the bits on the wool which um, grips each other which is what prevents it from kind of felting is like those little hairs like grip onto each other and um, become one solid piece or it's a combination of the chemical stripping and the uh, a plastic coating on top of the yarn so kind of in both cases I feel that it adds things to our waterway that shouldn't be there um, so like chemicals or like micro pollution from the plastic and um, nylon free is you know because of that being plastic as well so um, at the same time I'm finding that slightly difficult of a task because most people do use a standard superwash merino base um, or with or without nylon you blend um, spun into it and that's kind of the general indie dyer base so um, I'm kind of complete because on one hand I do want to support indie dyers but on the other hand I don't necessarily know if it's more sustainable if everyone uses the same base which is from my understanding all ordered from one or two mega corporations so and also like if a lot of time they're being shipped by air or boat doesn't that really cancel out any benefit you get from getting a sustainable yarn anyway I don't know the answer to any of those questions but for now I'm gonna tell you about the affordability aspect which I think I managed to capture in both of these projects so this one Fox, for Fox sake sweater um, I think the total cost of this project was maybe 40 to 60 dollars so I use knit picks gloss DK and um, gloss DK is a it was 
I think it's usually $6.99 US, but I paid um, $4, I believe, because, or like some of them I paid $4, some of them I paid $4.50, because I bought it during one of their sales, and I think they were also having like a sweater quantity sale, so you got like 15% off on top of all of that, if you bought a certain quantity. Um, so, um, this yarn... The base of it is a superwash, no, it's a non-superwash merino and um, silk blend. So it's really interesting and actually because of the non-superwash merino, I was able to spit splice the skeins together or balls together because, um, well basically for not, well, the benefit of non-superwash yarn is that they do felt together. So you can, um, when you're joining a new ball of yarn, instead of like doing any sort of complicated joins or leaving ends to weave in, you can kind of like split up those like little fibers, put them on top of each other, and split into your hand, and then you kind of rub until it felts together. And it makes that really easy to use non superwash. And like it does have this like glossy, and it's very soft, so it's very glossy, very shiny, so it imitates the yarn recommended in the in the original pattern um so it, it has that like glossy look of the superwash yarn and like but it also kind of blends together a little bit easier for the color work as well so like the non superwash is also a really important aspect of doing color work is that it allows the yarn to sort of set together cohesively a little bit better than like non superwash since like the strands don't like stay so because they like kind of hook for color work purpose that you kind of want them to hook onto each other to like form a full cohesive fabric so that's what i like about this yarn i have kept being asked about the durability of this yarn i can't really speak to that obviously because i've never made another project in this yarn and i've only had it for a week finished so i'm gonna i'll have to report back on the um, durability of this yarn. I have heard it either f kind of um, pills or maybe halos over time. Um, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not necessarily surprised by that, but all yarns kind of pill and halo, like there's not really yarns that don't, but, and I think um, considering like the, the, the non superwash aspect, I think it would pill a little bit more, but I think that's also the quality of the spin as well. So, all of those things. Um, as for the Willowwood, this is also a project which was fairly affordable because I did not use the original yarn, which is like $20 for like 100 yards, so um, and it called for like 10. So, um, so I, what I did was use two strands of Holskarn Noble held together for this project. And Holskarn is a company in Denmark and they have very affordable yarns because I believe they don't do any of the post treatment. Like they don't um, wash off the spinning oils, for example. So when you get this yarn, it's very like oily, you can smell like it's very, yeah, if you can smell it, it's, it's like, yeah, it's very oily. Um, and the yarn is also very, very light. So each ball is like 300 yards and then you can get a cone of 3000 yards. And I think the ball of like whole super soft is like $2. And then the cone you can of 3000 yards is like $28. So the whole scar noble isn't, um, another yarn in that range and it is, 95% Geelong, which is lamb's wool, I believe, and then 5% cashmere, so it's extremely soft. Um, it wasn't necessarily this soft when I was knitting with it, but once I washed it, it really bloomed out very nicely. Um, holding it double definitely did not get me a worsted weight, but I did really like the um, drapey quality that knitting at such a large gauge with a thinner yarn gave me, so it actually did work out quite well despite um, not really matching the qualities of the original yarn. I really like what I ended up with and um, I think it was, uh, I only ended up using like four of the, the um, 
red, which is Jacob, I think it's called. I don't remember what the silver is called, but, um, and maybe less than one altogether of the silver. So at like, I think it was at like $5 per ball. So I, no, I think I used three. So three, three. So basically I used three and a half in total. Obviously I bought like four and two, but I ended up using like three and a half balls all together for the project at like five dollars so you can tell it's not a not a very expensive project so um but the results i think is beautiful i'll of course have to report back on its durability over time but um so far i really like it so that's what i have to say about that i hope i didn't kind of come off as like preachy about any of the things but i feel like those are kind of my values when it comes to shopping um, and buying yarn and the materials I use. And so like don't feel in any way that I'm trying to like tell you how you're supposed to be knitting or shopping. Like this is ultimately about what makes us happy. Like knitting is such a meditative and like restorative act that it's ultimately about what makes you feel good. and. It makes me feel good to know that I'm being thoughtful about the projects and the materials that I'm choosing, but that might not be the same um, reasons or um, good feeling source for someone else. So I'm absolutely not saying that other people should be following these um, values and philosophies. I'm just um, letting you know that's how I do things. Now, all of those things said, and I think this ended up being much longer than I thought it would be, um, I do have some general announcements about my whereabouts for the next month. So I don't know if I told you before, but I am going to Edinburgh Yarn Festival next month. Really excited for that. I'm not just going to Edinburgh Yarn Festival. It's kind of part of my um, annual, I gotta get out of Ottawa trip. It kind of breaks up the winter and I know like seasonal effects hits me really hard here um, compared to when I lived in Vancouver because like it just was never this cold and you didn't feel like you were trapped inside your house and like that's kind of the feeling I get like it's a little bit of a cabin fear in Ottawa so I usually take a vacation around February, March to get out of town for a while. Um, so this year I'm going to Scotland for my trip and um, I've planned that around with one weekend dedicated to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. Um, I kind of want to tell you about the trip because I'm really excited. So um, I'm leaving Friday night. I have an overnight flight to London. I decided to do it Friday night because I get very um, anxious before flying even though I like doing it but I can't sleep the night before a flight so I decided you know what it'll be a normal work day since the flight is at 10 o'clock I'm just gonna go right after work and um, so that would save me a lot of the like thinking about all the things and logistics that I do usually when I'm like when I work a full day, go home, and then I have to go do a flight the next day. So that's my my reasoning for it. I didn't really need to explain that to you, but that, there it is. Um, and then when I land in London, I'm going to have a day in London. And I think I've made some plans to meet up with, well, a friend who had done a working visa here in um, Canada. And she was, she was like super cool. She did... Um, a cross Canada cycle tour so she they like they came from the UK and they um, landed in Vancouver they then rode their bikes all the way to Quebec City from which is an insane like they went from like the west coast they went up the Rocky Mountains and then through the prairies and then through Ontario which is like the biggest F in province and then through Co most of Quebec to the other side. No, they didn't make it all the way to it, but like through a lot of Quebec to Quebec City. So, um, and the only reason they didn't go all the way to the Maritimes was because they, um, the weather got too cold and they ended up coming to settle in Ottawa to, and then, um, yeah, that's how we met them. I actually was doing National Novel Writing Month 
and that's how I met uh, Sarah. So I think I'm gonna make plans to go meet up with her. I have tickets, like standing room tickets at like the Shakespeare Globe. I don't think it's the original. Like to be honest, I just kind of bought into the tourist thing and I was like, ah, oh, cool, the Shakespeare's Globe. So standing room tickets, I think it's gonna be cool anyway to feel the atmosphere of like standing there and watching the stage. Um, it's just like Romeo and Juliet or something. Um, I think it was five bucks for a ticket. So I was like, of course. Um, and then I think I'm meeting Nushka from the Crimson Stitchery podcast. We've been kind of conversing, so I think we could be getting brunch and um, seeing one of the local yarn stores. All of these plans are not as settled. That's my day in London. I'm going to Edinburgh the next day, but that's not when the Edinburgh Yarn Festival is. So I actually have three days, excuse me, where I booked a tour to go through the Isle of Skye and then I'm gonna come back to Edinburgh and then it'll be the festival and then afterwards I'm kind of gonna take the train up through to Inverness with stops along the way and then down the coast to um, like Fort William, Oban and I'm not saying that in the right order, Fort William um, somewhere else. Anyway, at, up through the isle, highlands, back down the coast, and then land, ending up in um, Glasgow at, on the last day before heading back to London and then back home. So that's my full itinerary. I'm so excited for that. Um, but speaking of Edinburgh Yarn Festival, I um, there's a possibility of having perhaps a meetup. So let me know if um, like a formal one is something that you're interested in during the festival itself. Um, and there's a few other meetups that um, I've been kind of coordinating with people. So if you're going to be at Edinburgh Yarn Festival, definitely reach out and I'm happy to share information on any of those things. Um, and also, as I said previously, I am planning on vlogging for my trip. So after doing the Vlogmas, I really had a very fun time doing like a day by day, much shorter video where I just like, it's whatever I can film on my phone and then like cobble together on my phone. That's going to be the rules for it. So some days it's going to be spectacular and some days it's going to be kind of weird. So um, I'm looking forward to that as like a memory of my trip. It's something that I wanted to do for a long time for the last few trips that I've gone on, but I've just never, um, I've al it's always been like, like felt like it was a lot of work where, um, whereas like the Vlogmas really showed me that it, it doesn't take long. Like I, do like I can edit in a very short period of time when it's just lots of little clips that don't require like crazy, like cutting out, like misspeaking moments, which I do often and things like that. So I think that's gonna be fun. Um, let me know if that's something that uh, you would like to see as well. And um, if there's any suggestions for any of the places that I'm going to, because if you're gonna be seeing the videos, I would love to know like what are things that you would like to see in those videos um and perhaps i can kind of do a well what i think my plan is i'm going to show you all the, the different sweaters and i'm going to bring with me because i usually like to wear sweaters like because it's easier to layer and then i can you know it's still warm enough if i take off my coat and things like that so i'll do like my edinburgh yarn festival wardrobe you know instead of doing like one sweater because I, I think these two will be definitely part of it and then i'll pick a few other ones maybe my luggage um anyway i'm just talking a lot now blah 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 blah, blah. what's the point of this don't know what the point of this is i will be there i will do content around it i hope that is something that you'll be interested in and thank you very much for joining me i love you and you can find me other places in the internet at books and cables on ravelry and instagram um knittightly.com is my blog where i am interviewing knitters mostly local knitters um and then getting them to tell me a story about the most important knitted object 
that they have ever made. Um, and it's a really special project to me, so I hope that you'll check it out. I'm working on the next post. I know it's been, I think, since November since I put up the blog post about Kinda, but I have one kind of ongoing that I think I'm almost ready to put up. And, um, yeah, thank you very much for joining me, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye!